Amen. All right, so this morning, uh, we're going to kind of take a pivot for a few weeks. Uh, I started to do this at the very beginning, and then I thought, no, I wouldn't. And then last week, I sort of dropped my bomb on you about what I think about the tribulation, the, the rapture, and so forth. So I thought it would be good, instead of just sort of pressing on, uh, to really stop and take a minute and think about what are sort of the views of the millennium, because how we understand the millennial reign of Christ really in, impacts and influences how we understand the rest of the book of Revelation. Um, I said last week that, um, well, maybe I won't prime you in that way, but suffice it to say that, that because there are so many views out there, that's part of what makes Revelation so controversial. It's also part of what makes it so hard to understand because you pick up book A and then you pick up book C, B and then you pick up book C and all three authors have a slightly different view of the millennium, which means that they divide the book in different places based on what is to happen, what has already happened, what's currently happening and so forth. Um, so that said, um, you know, I, I did sort of drop the bomb and tell you that I do believe that the church will go through the tribulation. I believe there's one plan of God for salvation for the church and for Israel instead of two separate plans. And I don't believe in a secret rapture. So I'm putting all my cards on the table right now. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't believe in a rapture. It just means I don't believe in a secret rapture. Um, so based on the looks that y'all gave me last week, and some of you are now giving me, you probably think I'm just this side of a heretic. Um, I am... <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe I am. I don't think I am. <laughs> the Lord has not convicted me that I am. Um, but what I want to do as we're looking through this is not just to defend myself, although that is admittedly part of it. Um, but we need to know that there are reasonable interpretations um, in a variety of ways about how the millennium functions and about how the book can be understood. Um, and then also to prove to you that I'm not a heretic. Uh, I think also, and this is something that we don't tend to think a whole, whole lot about, but even conversations like this are a bit of a master class for us whenever Peter tells us we need to be able to make a ready defense for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, right? Um, because Revelation is so controversial. Revelation is such a cultural moment. And I have met people who will use Revelation as their ammunition against a Christian to say, well, you don't know what you believe, right? Um, and it's because they're at least well-versed enough in this stuff. Maybe they don't know all the ins and outs, but they're well-versed enough in this stuff that they can catch you flat-footed, right? Um, so that's sort of the reason that I want to do this, and not, you know, least of all because I love doctrinal things and I find it incredibly interesting. Um, so... The first thing um, I want to do is look at what I'm actually talking about when I say the millennium, or the millennial reign. So this comes from Revelation chapter 20. Uh, I'm really jumping ahead because we're like three years away from Revelation 20. <laughs> um, and we'll come back to it, but I want to go ahead and look at it now. So we'll read verses 1 to 10. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Probably a bit more entertaining than 
the letters to the seven churches, admittedly. Uh, but this is it. This is sort of the giant question mark on the Revelation timeline. Um, so it might help first to take all of that and condense it just a little bit. What is the millennium? The millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ prior to Jesus' final coming. Okay? Um, next week, I'll give you a handout with all of this stuff on it. It just it didn't happen this week. But um, there are four camps and three categories concerning this. You've got the premillennial uh, camp, which is divided among the dispensational premillennial folks and the historic premillennial folks. You've got the postmillennial camp, and then you've got the amillennial camp. So premillennialism argues that Jesus' second coming will happen before the millennium. Okay? Um, there is some real differences between dispensational and historic premillennialism. Putting my own cards on the table, I'm historic premill. Okay? Um, this morning we're going to talk about dispensational premill uh, because I feel like that's probably the dominant idea, at least, that's in the room. Um, and I'm not up here doing this to tell you that you're wrong. My goal is to be as even-handed as possible, okay? Um, so you have dispensation when you have historic pre-mill. You have the post-mill crowd. These are the people who believe that the second coming happens after the millennium. So the short version on the post-mill folks is they believe that Jesus came, he ascended and was uh, taken back to heaven, and that's when the kingdom of God was inaugurated and that millennial reign whatever it is, uh, happens as the gospel is spread across the world and the world gets better and better and there's more Christianization and so forth and so on until all have heard the gospel. Then Christ comes back for judgment in the new heaven and the new earth, not a physical, political reign. Okay? And then amillennialism, which is the second coming with no literal millennium, actually the now millennium. Basically, Things don't necessarily get better and better like it does for the post-mill crowd. Um, but it's not literal in any sense. It's all symbolic, just that Christ is reigning on the throne now, and at some point he will just decide that the curtain is up, and, and this is it. Um, all right, so talking about dispensationalism then, because that's where I think we need to go first. Um, the dispensational view of the Bible, let me back up before we, we do this so you can kind of get an idea of how I'm going to go through. Um, with each of these views, I want to give you an understanding of how each view looks at the Bible as a whole, um, a definition of the distinctives of each view, and then some exploration of specific distinctives, a timeline for how those views expect the end times will occur, and then a discussion of the rapture and the role of Israel. Those are basically the two things that separate these four groups from one another, okay? Um, so, I have given us a small assignment in how we're going to do this. Uh, so, a dispensational view of the Bible, God reveals his plan of salvation through successive dispensations. Those dispensations are periods of time when man is tested in some respect of obedience, followed by disobedience and judgment, in order that the necessity of God's plan of salvation by grace would be cumulatively revealed. Um, so this is, in fact, I'll just go ahead and pull it up and show you. This is sort of a tame chart. Depending on your dispensational theologian, you can have five dispensations, you can have seven dispensations, you can have as many as 29 dispensations, depending on who's there and who's making the argument. All right, so you have the age of innocence, or the dispensation of innocence, of conscience, of human government. No, human government overlaps everything until the thousand-year kingdom. Um, inside that, you have the dispensation of promise, the dispensation of law, the dispensation of grace, and then you have the tribulation in which law comes back onto the scene. And then you have the thousand-year reign, um, followed by the great white throne judgment, and then eternity future. Um, I think one of the advantages of dispensationalism is it's internally consistent, right? It, it gives you these dispensations. It's very clear about what its parameters are in discussing these dispensations. And 
you know, it, it makes my head swim to look at some of the charts. I didn't put the confusing ones up here, but maybe next week I'll show you one just for fun. Um, Clarence Larkin, who was the original guy of at least making the, the visual representation of dispensationalism, these things are massive and they're really ornate and they're really confusing. So this is kind of like a tame version of it. When you get your head wrapped around it, it does make sense. Um, I, I think, at least for me, there are some places where it seems to be based on the Bible's silence rather than what the Bible says, um, but those are valid arguments too. All right. Um, so anyway, that is kind of this, this view of the whole Bible. I mean, you can see it beginning in creation and you see it ending with eternity, future, end of revelation kind of stuff. All right, so when we think about a definition of dispensational premillennialism, I'm not going to show you that yet. Um, dispensational premillennialism pre holds that a seven-year tribulation, which comes from Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, will precede a thousand-year period during which time Christ will reign on the throne of David. Immediately before the time of the Great Tribulation, all the dead saints will rise from their graves and all the living members of the church are going to be caught up with them in the clouds in the secret rapture. Now, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. Those are the, the texts there. Um, during this time of tribulation, there's three and a half years of world peace under the Antichrist figure who's going to establish a world church, followed by three and a half years of greater suffering. Um, at the end of this period, Christ will return, he will judge the world, he'll bind Satan for a thousand years, and then he's going to raise the Old Testament and tribulation saints from the dead. Now note, the strange, one of the strange things to me is the Old Testament saints do not get raptured with the church. Why? Because they are judged under law. Okay? Um, at this time, after the Old Testament and tribulation saints have been raised from the dead, the millennial reign will begin and Christ will reign politically over the earth from his capital in Jerusalem for a literal 1,000 years. Throughout this 1,000 year reign, there is no harmony. I mean, there is harmony. There is no war. Even the animals will live in harmony with each other. When he comes, this is sort of um, almost restoration of Eden kind of stuff that, that is envisioned here. At the end of that, Satan is released for Armageddon. And after Armageddon, Satan and the wicked are cast into the lake of fire, while the righteous proceed into the eternal state in the realm of the new heaven and the new earth. Okay? So, I've said all of that. This is what it looks like on a chart. Uh, I did not make this chart. This chart comes from Dr. Brian Chappell, who is, he's Presbyterian, but he's great anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, you have Old Testament prophecy. I don't know if you can see it very well, but I think one of the key things about this is this little loop that's going on behind all of this. So things are going along fine. Old Testament prophecy is only about Israel. You have a boom, a parenthesis for the Gentiles, for the church. Uh, birth of Israel, the nation, renewal of the Roman Empire, impending invasion. Some people take this to be Russia. This is the Gog and Magog business. Russia and the Arab states, something like that. Could also be the European Union in terms of the Roman Empire. Maybe it was Napoleon, maybe it's Mussolini. People thought it was Hitler. Name your world leader. Um, people on the other side of the political spectrum thought it was Ronald Reagan. You know, whatever. Um, however that happens, you have a moment of apostasy within the church. At which point, after that is over, you have the secret return. The reason that this thing is understood as a secret return comes from Daniel. Jesus doesn't, in this framework, Jesus doesn't bodily return to the earth. He catches them in the clouds. So he doesn't actually set foot on the earth. That's why it's not the second coming. Right? So he comes back, he meets them in the air, they go, the church goes away into heaven, whatever intermediate state that is. Then you have the seven years of the tribulation or you have the Antichrist and Armageddon and so forth. After the tribulation, you have the second coming, the millennial kingdom, Satan's little season with Armageddon. Then you have the resurrection of everybody, judgment, 
and eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. So again, it makes sense. I can follow it. It makes sense. But here are the particular distinctives of dispensationalism. We have these dispensations of testing, that should say, and judgment set up for, nece for the necessity of Christ. I would like to see the next one, please. Okay, well, they're showing up down here, but not up there. There we go. Uh, an age of parenthesis for the church and the Gentiles. Dispensationalists do not believe that the church is prophesied in the Old Testament. Uh, one thing about the way that dispensational understandings of the Bible unfold is it quite literally unfolds from the beginning to the end. You don't read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. You read the Old Testament as the Old Testament. You read the New Testament as the New Testament. Where the things overlap, such as prophecies about Jesus, that's fine. You read those in that way. But otherwise, if it's something about Israel, it's about Israel. Okay? Um, wrong way. Again. Separate and unique plans for Israel and the church. Now, we've talked about this already. I don't know if any of you will remember it or not. Um, I did a really quick one-week blitz through Romans 9 through 11 while we were doing Hebrews. Um, and we're going to talk more about that, so I won't say anything uh, yet. I need to get my buttons straight. And then the secret rapture. Okay. So, sorry, there is a fifth one. And then a literal millennium to convert the Jews and the world. So you can probably see where some of this thought process is going, where some of this stuff is, is leading to. Um, so the thing about the relationship between Israel and the church. Um, the reason why I want to spend time on this is because in order to understand Revelation effectively, we have to understand and we have to come to our own decisions about who the book was written for and who the book is written about. Okay. Um, so the unique contribution of dispensationalism is the idea that the bulk of the book, basically from chapter 4 to chapter 19, there are some variations in that. Um, I should pause here and note, this is like a very general idea. Just like with anything else, there are some dispensationalists who disagree with parts, and there are some who have other things that they have factored in here. This is just kind of what is common. So anyway... Um, Basically, from chapter 4 to chapter 19 is what Israel will experience during the Great Tribulation. It doesn't include the church. It has nothing to do with the church. Um, it begins with the rapture of the church. It ends with the second coming of Christ. The dispensationalist idea is that Revelation is written for all believers to tell us about the end time events and to reveal to us the character of God and Christ. But it's written about Israel. Now, the reason that they hold this really very strict separation between the church and Israel is, is for three primary reasons. One, the promises were originally given to Abraham's physical offspring, and they must be fulfilled by Abraham's physical offspring. Right? So it's none of this business about the spiritual offspring of Abraham. It is literally the people who are descended from Abraham who make up the nation of uh, Israel. Secondly, Israel always refers to ethnic Israel in the Bible. Any Old Testament titles given to the church are simply applications. They're simply metaphorical where the church is like Israel. But it is never that Israel is imported into the church, and it's never that the church replaces Israel. Right? And then thirdly, and this is, I think, maybe the defining feature when we're thinking about the relationship between Israel and the church and the dispensational mindset. The land promise made to Abraham has not yet been fulfilled. And it requires a future fulfillment by the nation in the millennial kingdom of Revelation 20. All right, so how does all this work? Um, if you're writing things down, you're just going to have to write things down kind of quickly because I didn't put a slide for all of this stuff up here. Um, so we're starting at the first one. The promises were originally given to Abraham's physical offspring and must be fulfilled by Abraham's physical offspring. This comes from Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. 
This is the promise God's making to Abraham. He says, And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay? Abraham certainly would have gathered that the covenant and the promises were for all of his offspring. Thus, the promises were given to all of the physical descendants of Abraham through Isaac. There is no distinction between the physical offspring who believed and the physical offspring who do not believe in the God of Abraham. This is just what bloodline do you fit into? Okay. So all Israelites possessed the land, all experienced the blessings of the Davidic kingdom, and all had the promise of the Messiah, whether they believed in it or not. It's also, I think, helpful to realize that one of the main themes here is that the Old Testament does not make much of a distinction between believing Israel and non-believing Israel. So it's not just that this is a very general statement in Genesis 17 to you and your offspring. But it is very true that in the Old Testament, Israel is the chosen nation. Israel is his people, right? Those are the phrases that are used there. It doesn't say those who believe or those who are good or faithful or whatever. Now, kind of one of my hiccups on this, but also, you know, one of the things that deserves to be pointed out, Galatians chapter 3, which we just finished, uh, the New Testament does tell us that Abraham has spiritual offspring. The dispensationalist argument against that, though, is the New Testament, even where it says that Abraham has spiritual offspring, nothing has ever said that those spiritual offspring are given that same inheritance that the physical offspring are given. Uh, it's always this physical versus spiritual kind of Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. Let's keep these groups separated. All right. Secondly, Israel always refers to ethnic Israel in the Bible. Any Old Testament titles given to the church are simply applications. So, I, I think this one's more easily addressed by starting with the objections rather than trying to do it from the front side. Uh, so, people who disagree with this point will often point to Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, and Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 to 16. So, in Romans 9, Paul says, It is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Okay? And then in Galatians, Paul says, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So those who disagree with this point will take those two verses, and they'll say, Paul appears to be saying that not all who are descended from physical Israel belong to the true Israel. So now we've got a third category in here. We've got the physical offspring, we've got the spiritual offspring, and we've got this thing that's true Israel up here. Um, for Paul, those who believe are a part of true Israel in one interpretation of that verse. Um, in Galatians, it appears that he's saying that those who walk by the rule of the new creation, both Jews and Gentiles, are the Israel of God. So people who disagree will say it appears that the name Israel is applied to new covenant believers. Where a traditional dispensationalist would respond to that is by saying that Paul is referring to believing Israelites within the church who retain their ethnic identity. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, Paul says, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. And by saying that, the dispensationalist thought process is Paul maintains three categories even in the gospel age. There is still a Jewish category. There is still a Greek or a Gentile category. There is still a church category. Okay? Uh, some will also suggest to the dispensationalists that titles regularly used of Israel in the Old Testament are made new by their application to the church in the New Testament. Um, the dispensationalist response to that is the church is the people of God at that time. 
right? So now we're in this parenthesis business. Israel was set aside. We are the people. We are the nation. We're the chosen nation. We're the chosen people. Uh, but let's have a parenthesis in this for the church because you rejected the Messiah. So now we're going to open this thing up to the Gentiles. Here's the church. Now we're going to close that off, rapture the church. We're back to Israel. So there's a moment where the church is the people of God, but Israel is sort of the eternal chosen group of God. So they say, because they are the people of God at the present time, the church is like Israel. Metaphorically speaking, these titles have been applied to the church, but they're not actually fulfillment of those titles. They're just application. So there's a distinction between fulfillment and application as well. Using those titles that are used of Israel in the Old Testament to describe the church in the New Testament does not mean that the church in any way fulfills, completes, or replaces Israel. I think that's the short version of it. And then we go back to the land bit. Israel still possesses their nation, national promises. That is, that is still Israel's at the end of the day. All right, so we go to the third one. The promises, particularly the land promise, has not yet been fulfilled and requires a future fulfillment by the nation in the millennial kingdom of Revelation 20. So the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15, 18 was to your offspring I give this land and from the river of Egypt to the, river, to the great river, the river Euphrates. And then later in Genesis 17, verse 8, God says, and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So you've got two things in play here. One, you have a physical description, a very precise geographic description of what will be Israel's land. Um, and then you also have that word everlasting. Right. The dispensationalists make two points related to this. One, that the exact uh, dimensions of the land were never possessed by Israel in the Old Testament. And two, those who say, well, okay, maybe they were. Um, it seems like in Joshua, at least, um, that area is possessed, that area and then some, but that area is possessed. Um, so even if they were possessed by Israel, they didn't get to keep them. It wasn't everlasting. Um, now, the, the lovely thing is that we all agree on something at this point. <laughs> um, we all agree that God is not making that promise and he's not enforcing that promise in the new heaven and the new earth because the new heaven and the new earth is going to be its own deal. But the dispensationalists argue that the land promises must be fulfilled in the present age. Since they've not been fulfilled in the present age, then the millennial kingdom is the completion of the land promises made to Israel. Hence why the church has to be out of the way. This is why the church gets raptured, one, one part. It's why the church gets raptured, okay? So that moves us. I know this is drinking, like drinking out of a fire hydrant. Uh, <laughs> Now we're going to go to the rapture. <laughs> um, so there are four reasons why the dispensationalist view believes the church will be removed from the earth in the rapture before the beginning of the tribulation. The distinction between Israel and the church requires the removal, removal of the church before God can again deal with Israel. This is an argument from logic. It's a sound argument. Secondly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18 pictures a secret removal of the Christians to be with Christ in heaven. Thirdly, the church is not referred to in any of the tribulation passages in the Old or New Testament. And fourthly, the pre-tribulation rapture allows for an any-moment return of Christ. Okay. I think this is where probably... Well, we'll see next week because we'll look at historical premillennialism next week, which is where I fall. Um, let, me, let me stop right for a moment and say something about the rapture. I think this is in some ways an argument that has been pushed beyond its usefulness. When he comes, he comes. It doesn't matter whether we think it's time or not, <laughs> right? Um, but it does influence how we read Revelation, how we read Daniel, how we understand our role as the church and as Christians in that sequence of events. And so I think that's why it's useful to talk about. But it should not be something that divides the church. And it has become something that divides the church. Um, 
Kevin can probably give me an amen. Uh, Carrie, you've got all four of those views represented, and they don't often mingle. I mean, it's very weird. Even in the BSU, where you think everybody would be happy-go-lucky, they don't mingle. Uh, and, you know, some of it is stupid. Some of it is intellectual superiority. People think because they hold this view or that view or the other view that they're smarter than everybody else. No, you're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, that, you know, that, that issue even goes into politics and everything else. You get politicians who think they're smarter than the people who elected them, so they're going to go up there and do what they want instead of the will of the people. It's a, Nope. You know, the, the, the smartest people I've ever been around are the people who have looked at me and told me something and then said, but you know, I could be wrong. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's... Let's get raptured out of here, shall we? Uh, <laughs> okay, so the purpose of the tribulation for the dispensationalist is so that God can fulfill his promises, his warnings, and his threats to Israel in order to bring them back to God in faithful submission to the Savior whom they produced and then they denied. So we go to John. He came into the... And came into the world, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own knew him not. That rejection, and then Paul says, it's Romans 9 or 10, I forget which, um, that the Jews were made jealous because they gave the Messiah, but the Messiah was given to the Gentiles as well. Um, so the idea behind the tribulation is that Israel has got to be brought back into order, and this is Israel's moment if you, okay, if you ever hear anybody, I didn't put this in my notes because I didn't think it was relevant, but now I do. If you hear anybody talking about the tribulation, a lot of the time, um, they will talk about either that God owes Israel three and a half years of peace because that last, um, that last week in Daniel 70 weeks, that last week is interrupted. Um, so that God owes them that. Um, but more importantly, you'll hear people say, basically anybody who's not, dispensational, premillennial, that we don't have a plan for ethnic Israel, that we don't allow a continuing plan for ethnic Israel. And the dispensationalists, because there is this separation between Israel and the church, that fixes that problem, because then God in the tribulation can deal with ethnic Israel. Um, So if the church is a parenthesis, now I'm on this first point, if the church is a parenthesis in God's program with Israel, so if we understand the Bible is not primarily about the church, but as primarily about Israel with an interlude for the church, then the church is not part of Israel's covenant, it's not part of Israel's purposes, and the church should not be present during the tribulation. We should expect the church to be absent from the tribulation because the things that are being done there don't concern the church. And that's the, the first and the most basic reason uh, for the removal of the church before the tribulation. Um, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and especially 16 to 18, pay attention here to the phrase in Christ and the, phrase, or the word removed. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an, arch, an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Okay? Note the difference. In Christ refers to the church. This doesn't say anything about Israel. This doesn't say the true Israel. It doesn't use any of those phrases. It says in Christ. So from a dispensationalist view, 
those in Christ who are caught up will always be with the Lord. Those people do not come back. They go to the Lord and they're there. There's nothing about returning to the earth. There's nothing about Jesus establishing his kingdom. There's nothing about Jesus judging the nations. All of that's what happens at the second coming. Paul doesn't include that in this description. So, therefore, this isn't the second coming. This is a secret coming to get the church out. He'll be back to cast judgment later. All right? The church is not referred to in any of the tribulation passages in the Old or New Testament. And this is certainly true of Old Testament passages about the tribulation, like Ezekiel 20. I didn't put it in my notes, but... Um, Ezekiel 20, verses 34 to 38 where Ezekiel says, well, speaking for God, of course, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge out the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. There's just one example for you. Um, if we go back to Matthew chapter 25, 31 to 46, the final judgment. This is Jesus talking about the final judgment. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'll read bits and pieces. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And this is the, uh, what you did to this, I was this, and you did this for me, and I was that, and you did that for me, and so forth. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, I was hungry and you didn't do, I was this and you didn't do. Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There is no mention of the church there. There is only a mention of the judgment of the nations there. Okay. So these tribulation passages, these judgment passages, don't actually refer to the church, literally. Um, they also say that though the church is referred to several times in Revelation 1 to 3, it isn't mentioned at all from Revelation 4 to 21. This is another sign, and a very, I think, logical, literal sign, that the tribulation doesn't deal with the church, but only with Israel. Because if it dealt with the church, why would the church not be mentioned there? This is one of those arguments from silence. Uh, I don't discount it, because it's not there. Uh, at the same time, I think it's maybe not paying attention to the broader scope of the book of Revelation. That's where I take issue with that particular point. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that next week. And then finally, the pre-tribulation rapture allows for an any-moment return of Christ. We get this from Luke chapter 12, verse 40, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. So in Luke 12, verse 40... You, must also be, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, But you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Okay, those are both there, they're both true. They're both inspired and they're both inerrant. But Jesus taught that certain signs must be fulfilled before he returns. The preaching of the gospel to all nations in Mark chapter 13, verse 10 false prophets working signs and wonders in Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 to 24, and the rise of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. So how can his return be unexpected and sudden if also these other things have to happen? Well, I'm so glad you asked. The pre-tribulation rapture solves that conflict for the dispensationalist because the rapture is a secret coming of Christ. So rather than a bodily interaction with the earth, he meets his children in the air later to bodily return 
after the tribulation. And during the tribulation, those things that he predicted will happen. So he can come for the church whenever. Then you have the tribulation, and you have that whole project, which ends with the second coming.